Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Advisor Innovations Podcast. After a bit of a break there in the fourth quarter of last year, we're back. We have a new season of episodes coming up, some great conversations around innovations in the business of financial advice. My name is David Armstrong. I'm the editor-in-chief of wealthmanagement.com. As you know, this podcast is the podcast which, if nothing else, it just gives me the opportunity to speak to the individuals moving the wealth management industry forward into new, potentially interesting areas. We've got a great lineup of folks slated to come on the podcast, so I hope you will subscribe to it, leave a comment, maybe a review, and as always, reach out to me, david.armstrong at informa.com, if you have suggestions for any topics or people you'd like to hear from. Today, I'm thrilled to be speaking to Mark Miller. Mark is a Chicago-based journalist, an author, and a podcaster, probably best and most informed writer I know on retirement issues. He's been a contributor to Wealth Management Magazine, our magazine, for as long as I've been here. He writes great stuff for us, informative. Uh, advisors learn a lot from him. In addition to us, he's a regular contributor to many other pub publications, including the New York Times, Reuters, Morningstar. He runs his own very informative website at retirementrevised.com, and he has just released his book called Retirement Reboot. Common Sense Financial Strategies for Getting Back on Track. We recently ran an excerpt from the book in the most recent issue of Wealth Management Magazine, which you can find on our website, uh, as well as Mark's columns for financial advisors. Mark, thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. And thank you for those kind words of introduction. Appreciate it. I was going to ask, Mark, this is not your first book. How many books have you written? Uh, this is my third, he said, rolling his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> It's my third. You're going to get it right first, eventually. Yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully this is the one. My first one, I published right in sort of the teeth of the Great Recession. It was called The Hard Times Guide to Retirement Security. It's all about how to kind of survive the Great Recession. And the second one was called Jolt, Story, Jolt Stories of Tra Trauma and Transformation. It was sort of a little bit of a side trip for me uh, down a road that I hit upon as a result of my writing about retirement, which was people who had gone through you know, midlife or later big life transitions as a result of something very traumatic that went on in their lives. And um, that was a, a kind of a sidebar to the reporting I've done over the years on retirement and career transitions. And and now this new one. Yeah, that's great. Jolt, uh, uh, big transitions, uh, uh, unexpected transitions. We certainly had one of those recently with the pandemic. Um, yeah. I don't know if that gave you any uh, impetus to write this book or if you were already writing it. What what was your strategy with this book? What were you hoping to accomplish? Uh, what did you accomplish uh, very well? I've read the book. I, I, it's it's a great, great, a lot of great information in there. Uh, but tell me where you were coming from when you wanted to approach this. Yeah. So having reported on retirement now for about 15 years, I'm just repeatedly struck by the way that much of the journalism that's generated kind of in the personal finance space is aimed at, it's like, it strikes me as kind of the weight of coverage is in a way upside down. Most of it is about investing and that's fine. I mean, investing is an important component of retirement security. I don't need to tell the audience for this program that, uh, but, but the, what we know also is that retirement portfolio is an investing that that's important to, depending whose numbers you look at, maybe a third to 40% of households that have been able to amass retirement portfolios of any significance. And for the, for the other, let's say 60%, they're going to be relying mostly on Social Security, Medicare, maybe tapping home equity. They're, they're not people who have been able to save for retirement. And yet, you know, I didn't see, a lot gets written about this kind of in the public policy sphere, you know, the retirement crisis and what do we do about it? But precious little in terms of guidebooks to try to help that part of our population getting close to retirement, figure out how to improve their retirement security. So, and I've always had a very holistic view of the retirement scene. As you know, I write a lot about Social Security and Medicare, for example, probably more than, than most people in this space. I just felt that, you know, having done this for 15 years, I thought, I actually sat down and kind of did a back of the envelope calculation and figured out that over the time I've been covering the beat, I've written more than a thousand articles. If you throw in podcasts, newsletters, the rest, maybe 3000 or so interviews. And, uh, you know, as you know, very well, I think one of the real privileges of being a journalist is you get to learn from smart people about stuff. You know, that's what it's all about is figuring out 
who are the people who are smart about whatever it is you're reporting on and get them to educate you about things. So having done all those interviews and stories and all that research, I thought, I think there must be something here I could distill, distill into a book on the smartest, most sensible, trustworthy advice that would be valuable to this audience we're talking about. Now, you know, having said that, I think that there are chapters in the book and information in the book that it will be of interest to a much wider audience than just those who haven't saved. So for example, the chapter in there about optimizing social security benefits or how to navigate our complicated Medicare system. Or uh, I have a chapter in the book about purpose in retirement and, and another on kind of managing your career late in the game. You know, there's a variety of chapters in the book that I think have a little more broad appeal, but the impetus and focus for me was how do we help people who are getting close to retirement, who are going to, they're facing a gap. You know, we know that if you're relying just on social security, it's going to replace maybe 40% or so of your pre-retirement income. And replacement of income in retirement to me is the most important and basic measure of how you're going to do in retirement. It's like, can you maintain your standard of living basically? So if you're going to get 40% from social security, we know that you're going to need something more than that in terms of pre uh, replacement of income to maintain your standard of living, depending on, again, how you slice the numbers. You know, we know in the financial planning field that the rule of thumb is you need to replace 70 to 80%. Now, I, I think that's a very general figure. And I think there are definitely ways to move that number down. And I think Research tells us that the number does move up and down across retirement. So, but just as a very gross general indicator, if you're going to get 40% from Social Security and if you might need 60 or 70%, there's a problem there. So, that was the impetus for the book. Yeah. Uh, you write uh, early on in the book that uh, one of the biggest uh, hindrances uh, here yeah. is complexity. Right. Uh, right. What do you mean by that? Uh, why, why so the, complex, the, where does complexity come in and why is that such a problem yeah. for people's retirement? So, well, the good news about complexity is it provides a, a living for people like me who can explain complicated <laughs> stuff to people who need to navigate it. But I was talking to somebody about these the other day and I said, you know, as good as that's been for me, I would actually be happier to be unemployed, but know that the system was simpler. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do I mean by this? Well, we, we don't really have a single system for uh, retirement in the country. We have a c series of, or a patchwork of systems that do and don't talk to one another very well. And some are extremely complicated to navigate for the average person. I think I could I can give many examples, actually, but my poster child for this actually is Medicare. You know, the, the transition to Medicare from em typically employer provided coverage you know, when you're jumping from one health insurance silo to the next, it can be complicated. It's um, full of potential pitfalls that can cost you money and they can get you stuck on one track or another of coverage without even realizing it. Uh, the system is built in a way where it really pushes and requires almost that enrollees recheck and reshop their coverage on a regular basis. I've written about this ad nauseum for you and others, you know, mm -hmm. during the fall enrollment season, nagging people to recheck their coverage. Very people do, very few people do it. You know, we've, we've added a lot. At, the reason that I think Medicare has become so complicated is that we've added a lot, quite a bit of privatization to it that I, I actually think is unnecessary and not helpful. But nonetheless, as we have, we have these online uh, marketplaces for shopping for different components of the program, such as prescription drug coverage, or if you opt into the Medicare Advantage, uh, which is which is the commercially offered uh, managed care alternative to regular old Medicare, you know, you need to shop, you know, in a typical major urban market in the United States, there might be 25 or 30 different plan choices to, to wade through. And it's, you know, doing that well uh, re requires, I think, some expertise, either that you develop yourself or or that you get from an advisor, some kind of some kind of help. So, you know, I, I, we could we could go on and discuss the, uh, discuss other ways that it's complicated, but you know, I just think there's a we've shifted a lot of the the onus of figuring stuff out over the decades from kind of the older I'll call it more paternalistic system, meaning you work for an employer your whole life, maybe you had a pension that the employer ran. That was kind of on autopilot. You'd retire, you get the benefit. Now it's all up to us to figure out how to save for retirement, how to invest, how to 
how to draw down. I mean, you know, again, this is an audience that will understand this point super, super well, but the challenges of managing money in retirement, you know, how do you figure out drawdown rates, w- which pool of money to draw from when, uh, interaction of drawdowns and taxes. Mm-hmm. You know, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, that, that's a, a bigger, the, um, do you get the sense that financial advisors, I, I think they've gotten pretty good at weighing the calculation around when to take social security and, and, you know, when you should pull the trigger on that and what it means for, mm-hmm. uh, your, your benefit in the, in retirement. Uh, but Medicare seems like a kind of a black hole for advisors, right. many of them. Is that, is that your sense too? Yeah, definitely. I think over the time I've covered retirement, advisors and the general public have gotten the word about the incredible beneficial uh, rewards of delayed claiming of Social Security. Now, far too many, not enough people are delaying enough. The, the data tell us that most people have claimed by their full retirement age. Maybe 15% are claiming it, the really delayed ages, you know, 68, 69, 70. Uh, but there has been an improvement in the percent that are claiming at the earliest age. Fewer are claiming at 62. And there's no, I just want to say, I don't think there is a highly personal decision. There can be reasons, good reasons to claim early. But for most people, and especially married couples, delay is better. It doesn't necessarily mean you got to delay till 70, although that would be great. But some delay, certainly past full retirement age, is is a good thing for most people. And I think most advisors have gotten on board with that and are pretty good at helping clients think about it. Although I think far too many advisors are still relying on kind of the break-even methodology and looking at cumulative lifetime benefits to illustrate mm-hmm. all that which I think, I guess is okay, but it's not my preferred approach. I think a much better approach is just simply to look at social security as longevity insurance and the implications of just maximizing monthly or annual benefits with the idea that, especially in married case of married couples, one spouse is pretty likely to live well past the mortality averages to a pretty advanced age. And that's where a higher social security benefit by the way, adjusted every year for inflation, he said in bold face letters with underscoring, <laughs> um, really comes in handy, even for households that think they don't particularly need to rely on Social Security. I think the evidence is pretty good that a lot of households can adv- can exhaust their savings by the time you know a surviving spouse is in his or her 90s. So, so that's the Social Security side. Now, you're, I agree with you. I think Medicare is kind of less explored territory. I, my guess is you, you might have a for perspective on this, uh, as well as, as mine, I think, you know, health insurance is just seems like such a, like you say, kind of a black box that a lot of advisors don't want to get into. There are a lot of services out there, you know, you can avail yourself of for advice and it'd be good if at least advisors were getting good at pointing people towards trustworthy resources for guidance on Medicare. The, um, the survey data on this is suggests that we're not doing well, you know, about, I think when you look at, ask people on Medicare where they got guidance, a lot of it's sort of, well, I got it from a friend or family, or I just signed up for the brand that I was already getting at work. Um, a lot of, a lot of people rely on insurance brokers, which I think in one respect is fine. I think brokers typically are quite knowledgeable about the insurance lines they carry. The bad news is that brokers are only going to carry one or two lines. And like I was saying, and in a big urban market, when you're looking at something like Medicare Advantage, there might be a couple dozen choices. So you need to survey the entire landscape to get the right answer. I think it's harder to get that uh, from a broker. And of course, in brokers are commission compensated. So there, there may be some issues there too, in terms of best interest and so on. Beyond your own columns, uh, can you suggest some resources for advisors to maybe go for a uh, uh, balanced and uh, nuanced and unbiased advice around Medicare? Decisions. Sure. Sure. I, I think the, the top option actually is the one that is jointly sponsored by states and the federal government. Every state has one of these programs. They're called SHIP programs, state health insurance information programs that, um, as I say, they're jointly funded by some federal money and typically state department of aging. And then they have these trained expert volunteer counselors who can help people with Medicare enrollment. 
and um, you know it's unbiased advice. So those are good. Um, there are several services out there, uh, names escaping me at the moment, but uh, that for a small fee you can you can get an evaluation of of best match Medicare coverage. And again, so that's fee based as opposed to commission. You know, I think those are good. One thing I would be careful with, a lot of people sort of assume that when they're transitioning to Medicare, that their employer's um, human resources department is a good resource for this. And I think the evidence is that that's questionable. You know, in HR departments, hopefully are good at understanding their own benefit programs, but Medicare is not their program. It's complicated. I see evidence all the time of people getting wrong steers from HR departments on the complexities of that. So it doesn't hurt to ask an HR department, but I would go further than that and and get a second opinion from somebody that's yeah. a Medicare specialist. Uh, I think a lot of advisors also are uh, pushed to sell long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that you see uh, uh, worthwhile, uh, uh, something that uh, advisors should look at carefully, or is it more of a product that's sold <laughs> well, I have a chapter in the book about long-term care risk. I think this might be the most dysfunctional part of our insure of our retirement, let's call it a safety net. You know, it's completely it's look, we have a situation where affluent households, probably the lion's share of the clients that, you know, advisors are dealing with, generally speaking, can afford to self-insure against against this risk. Um, middle-class households, which is really the ideal target for a long-term care insurance policy, uh, which is really the target audience for my book, people with modest savings or none, are, it's very difficult to afford these policies. You know, they've gotten to the point now where they cost traditional, uh, long-term care insurance policies for a married couple might start at 4,000 a year, 5,000, and there's no protection against very big double digit rate hikes, which have been almost the norm in the business now as the insurance industry tries to grapple with the problems of pricing that they've they've had. So that's a tough, a tough sell. And um sales have been dropping like a stone for the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. And then low income households are generally going to be insured by Medicaid. So we don't have a good answer there. Now there's these hybrid uh li life insurance uh policies with long-term care riders and the like. And Again, those are really only affordable to people with significant assets. So I wonder if they're really worth it. If you got mm -hmm. to sink a hundred thousand dollars into one of these policies versus just saying I'll just self-insure. So yeah, you know, I don't think there's a good answer on this. I I've written and said for years that I think the smart thing for this country would be if we built a sort of a basic long-term care benefit into the Medicare program. So that there'd be at least some baseline of coverage for middle class households and and above. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could have the ability for insurance companies to sell uh, supplemental coverage on top of that. So if you wanted something a little richer, you could buy an LTCI policy uh, and on top of your Medicare benefit. Of course, Medicare doesn't cover long term care insurance, long term care. It does cover 100 days in a skilled nursing facility following a hospitalization, but sort of with the ongoing supports that people need for just daily things, you know, making meals, bathing, transportation, et cetera, uh, it's not covered in Medicare. So I, I think there've been several commissions that have put together kind of on a bipartisan basis to study what's the solution to the long-term care conundrum. Um, the last round of these things was in the last couple of years of the Obama administration. There were, I think, three that were put together with kind of assiduous balance of people across the ideological spectrum, but who were experts on insurance and long-term care risk. Pretty much they all came up with the answer that some kind of hybrid public-private solution would make a lot of sense, but it's it's gone absolutely nowhere. And those, those studies are, are gathering dust yeah. on the shelf. Yeah, uh, complicated stuff. Uh, you know, you talk about uh, replacing income and retirement as being the, the goal here, really. Uh, you don't spend a lot of time on uh, annuities in no. the book. And I'm wondering uh, why that is. Is that a, is Because the main reason is they're not affordable for the target audience of the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are if you don't have money saved, what, what are you going to have available to sink into an annuity? Uh, so that's the big reason. 
uh, the second reason is it's a topic that gets a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of noise and a lot of yeah. coverage, but very little action. I mean, there's just not a lot of going on in terms of annuity purchases in the marketplace. Now, I, I think there are, I do think there are a couple of products that are interesting. In particular, circling back to long-term care, I've written about this from time to time. That, for example, deferred income annuity, I think, is a possibly an interesting solution for somebody worried about a long-term care need, you know, purchase it now, purchase it in your sixties with the idea that income wouldn't flow until sometime in your eighties, should you get there, you mm -hmm. know, it's a deeply discounted product that I, you know, I think if I, I think I do actually mention that in the long-term care chapter, but that's the reason I didn't dive into annuities. Cause I think for the, one of the things that was useful about putting this focus on the book in terms of who's the reader was it gave me a lot of, helped me a lot in terms of deciding what was in and what was out as a topic. So annuities was one that was out. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Uh, you know, I think from the, from our side, we, we see uh, a lot of meshing together now of uh, kind of the traditional wealth management financial advisory space with uh, retirement plan advisors, advisors to plan sponsors. You know, they're, these firms are kind of coming together. If you're a traditional RIA, you're starting to perhaps uh, get into retirement plan sponsor advice for your clients that own businesses. Maybe you're taking on their 401k business. Mm -hmm. You know, and then on the other side, the retirement plan advisors uh, are looking for ways to keep participants as clients after they leave the company. You know, and I think there's a lot of work being done in annuitizing the the 401k, yes. right? The uh, right a lifetime lifetime income is the is the phrase that's tossed around these days. Uh, and that's interesting know, for a variety of reasons. I think that there's a lot of potential there to infuse the workplace plan with more guidance for retirees and people transitioning to retirement. And then again, the as you're saying, the possibility of building more lifetime income supplements in there, I think, is quite interesting. I mean. It's not a brand new thing, right? Like a TIA, CREF has been doing this for years, mm -hmm. right? The ability, if you have a 403B through TIA, CREF at say a university or whatever, you know, they've had these products like TIA Traditional, which you can easily convert all their part of it into an annuity at retirement. You know, it's a good product. Um, you, yes, more of that would be good. I'm, I'm not like trying to say I'm anti-annuity, but I think the complexity, again, going back to complexity, right? Is there a more complex marketplace? I can't think of one than annuities. It's crazy mm -hmm. complicated. Yeah. So if you had something that was vetted and under the fiduciary umbrella of a 401k plan, low cost, easy to administer, and you could say to workers at retirement, hey, would you like to convert 25% or whatever of your portfolio to a lifetime annuity? You know, I think that could be very beneficial. Yeah, I mean, we could go deep on this, but the uh, uh, challenge is that you're, asking advisors to advise in a fiduciary yeah. capacity on something that's going to continually draw down. And that's, it's right. just not a good, you know, same, same problem for the plan sponsor. If I, yeah, right. Right. You know, if I have uh, that right. It's, it's, so it's a, you know, it's, it's kind of a thing that lends itself to a commission sale, but then you get into the kind of complexities that you're talking about. I don't know, I don't right. know what and, the answer is, but you sorry. know, okay. I would just interject one other thing about this is that when we talk about the employer providing benefits that are flowing throughout retirement, if anything, the trend's been the opposite director, direction. Like I've actually been doing some research on retiree health benefits, um, mm -hmm. which is at the category of decline, you know, as recently as the late eighties, you know, 65% of people who work for large employers could expect some kind of retiree health benefit, typically it'd be a supplemental benefit in Medicare that's plunged to maybe 20%. So, you know, employers have been washing their hands of that stuff. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you, you have some other thoughts in the book on replacing uh, income in retirement uh, for the audience that you're talking about. Things like, uh, you know, uh, holding on to equities longer than maybe traditionally uh, right. a retirement plan would suggest. What, what, is your, what, what are your findings there? Well, so I have a chapter in the book about building savings even if you're getting a relatively late start. And I think this is what you're referencing that I try to illustrate that it's worth doing, even if you're, you think it's too late because the, the end goal point is not the day you retire, but kind of a through point through retirement. So 
actually worked on this section of the book with Vanguard and had them run illustrations, you know, Monte Carlo style illustrations, you know, what ifs, if you did this, if you did this, if you did this, looked at variations in types of investments from a fee perspective, just to illustrate that it's very possible to build something meaningful, as long as you're not just looking at it as the, you know, the finish line is not the day you retire. And then you get into the conversation about what's the appropriate amount of equities to have in the mix after retirement. And that's the whole target date fund mm -hmm. debate. You know, um, I think a lot of people are still kind of surprised individuals to realize how much of their portfolios are still in, in equities when they're in target date funds um, at the point of mm -hmm. retirement. You know, so TDFs, I think, have been a useful innovation in a lot of respects to really, um, for the accumulation phase because it keeps people on balance in their asset allocations. I think it's a questionable product to keep using past the point of retirement, I think. And the data tells us most people actually do transfer out of them into other mm -hmm. types of investments at that point. But you know, I think that's the issue is you know how much how much equity do you really need? Now, you know, Morningstar's recent study on safe withdrawal rates Interestingly, they conclude that higher equity allocations don't really improve portfolio sustainability from a drawdown rate perspective, just because of the volatility in the equity side um, mm -hmm. and what you can count on. So when they're modeling safe withdrawal rates, one of their one of their key conclusions, which was might sound counterintuitive, was higher equity allocations won't help you. <laughs> And that does go against the you know sort of traditional yeah. uh, uh, thought, right? Where I, yeah. I remember there were a few years there where people were saying that the problem with the uh, target date funds was that they were yeah. too heavily weighted towards bonds, right? When when you approach retirement, they should they should be heavier in equities because people will have you know now 20, 30, maybe forty years to go, right? But Why if you like you in all equity, right? Go but if, yeah, yeah, but if you spin back to the the Great Recession, one of the big things that happened there was people who were in TDFs were shocked to see their portfolios drop by half. Mm -hmm. And then they they looked at the allocations and said, well, yeah, I'm 65% in equity. So if anything, I think the equity allocations have dropped a bit. But if you look at the really big providers, the, the big three are Vanguard, T. Rowe, and uh, Fidelity. You know, they're also pretty pretty high on equity at the at the point of retire at the target date. Of, uh, they vary a little bit in their philosophies, but not a ton. Yeah, and uh, you know, the year that we just came through, uh, you know, the worst year for fixed income in, in memory. Uh, I imagine that there are a lot of people on the cusp of retirement thinking that that ballast that was supposed to be there uh, in the in the bonds it wasn't, right? Right. Uh, that's, uh, right. It was a shock to a lot of people that maybe these traditional ways of thinking about allocations, portfolio allocations, uh, aren't necessarily hard and fast rules. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it was anything, you know, we, uh, we're on the, you know, the near, I guess, uh, I don't know what the latest is, a, a debt ceiling debate, it seems like, mm -hmm. again, right. uh, for uh, the however many umpteenth time in my lifetime. Yep. One of the things that constantly comes up is the, well, these Social Security and Medicare are the, the two big buckets that have to be addressed for any of this to ever resolve itself in any sustainable way. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that that's uh, just more politics? This is this is politics. I think it'd be useful to break it down and talk about it first in the context of Social Security, and secondly in the context of Medicare, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. You know, Social Security is a self-funded system. The the revenue that flows into it is dedicated revenue from FICA, from the the payroll tax. Now, the way it gets accounted for on the books of the federal government is another matter, but it's a self-funded system. It's the Social Security by law cannot borrow money. In fact, it's the opposite. Social Security lends money to the federal government in the form of uh, what happens with the interaction in the trust fund with the, with Treasury notes. So, I mean, Social Security has been operating at a surplus of roughly $3 trillion now for, for a couple of decades. And that money doesn't just sit somewhere. It's lent out uh, in the form of Treasury notes. So we're looking at a system here now the federal government's responsible for meeting the obligations treasury has to pay out the benefits but the, the dollars are dedicated and segregated so i think the debt ceiling comes into play here just because the republican party does not have majority control of congress it doesn't have the white house its leverage point seems to be a threat to not pay the bills you know 
we've, we've put mm-hmm. money on the credit card and I would say, well, we're not going to pay the bill unless you agree to do X, Y, and Z. And the, it's a longstanding goal of the Republican Party to make further cuts in Social Security benefits. So when they talk about higher retirement ages, for example, well, that's a benefit cut. Now, mm-hmm. why is it a benefit cut? Because you, what you've done is raise the bar on what it takes to get to your full retirement benefit at full retirement age. So for example, we just are wrapping up raising the retirement age from 65 to 67, which was done very gradually under the reforms that were legislated in 1983. And it's been moving up you know, a month or two at a time. And anybody born after 1960 and, 1960 and beyond, their full retirement age is 67. And you, the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College has a great chart on this where they illustrate, the, if you will, the effect of higher retirement ages on benefits. And so what they did is they look at a sort of a hypothetical retiree who is retiring at age 65 with an average benefit level. And they say, well, what? how much uh, income replacement will that person get uh, at different in different years. So in 1995, that person would have received 41% replacement rate. In 2015, it was 36%. And in 2035, it's going to be 29%. So that's a dramatic drop in the deal, if you will, that Social Security is providing, Mm -hmm. not so much for boomers or, or people who are already retired. It's, you know, today's younger workers are looking at a much worse deal from Social Security. So now Republicans want to boost it from 67 to 70. So that that's a would be a huge huge benefit cut depending on how it's implemented. So it's that's part of it's just in my view political and it's the wrong move. We should not be cutting Social Security benefits any further for all the reasons we've been talking about on this program. Now Medicare, and as you say, as you say yeah, re, and before ahead. we get into Medicare, as you say, yeah. uh, reneges on the contract, right? Uh, we we had this established, uh, you know as each of us contribute to this fund, yes. it's with the understanding that this is the benefit coming out the other side. Yeah. I mean, whether it's a contract or not is an interesting question because Congress has the right to make changes, but but it's a reneging on the promise, I guess, of right. Social Security. And and um, I think younger workers would should have every reason to be outraged about this. And I wish and hope that younger people will get more focused on this if if this, in fact, turns into a live debate. Uh, because they're the ones who are going to get hurt the most if we if if these kinds of changes are forced on the program. That's yeah. the way I think about it. Now, on the Medicare side, it's a little different because Medicare has the different parts of Medicare are funded differently. So the part A of the program, which is hospital insurance, that's funded in, similar to the way Social Security is funded. There's a dedicated part of the payroll tax that goes to that. So it's it's segregated to dedicated income, if you will. The other parts of the program, so that would be part B as in, B as in boy, which is outpatient services, and part D, which is prescription drug. Those are a mix of general government revenue and premiums paid by enrollees, 25% of whatever the projected program cost for part B in any given year is born. That's what determines the premium and the rest comes out of general revenue. So, you know, as healthcare costs escalate, there is an issue there with respect to, um, how we fund the program from the, the the general revenue or the government obligation, if you will. So it's a fair point to say that that figures into uh, the costs of running the government, but that doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily follow that cutting Medicare benefits, for example, by raising the eligibility age to seventy. That's a proposal out there. It would be a disaster to do that for a variety of reasons. It doesn't hold that that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, if we want to go back to the idea of a promise or obligation that we have to people in retirement to the extent that Medicare costs are rising is just mirroring what's going on in the healthcare economy. And there are a lot of other ways to, to write that ship that we could get into if you wanted to, but that's the way I look at the debt ceiling. You know, it's really, this is really about politics and how do mm-hmm. we, how do we as a minority party force the changes we want on the majority and public polling, by the way, suggests that, Strong, strong bipartisan majorities on the order of 75, 80% of the public wants opposes cuts in Social Security and Medicare, even if it means higher taxes. Yeah, yep. Uh, we just recently passed the uh, you know, Secure, what we're, we're talking, Secure Act uh, 2.0, uh, 
uh, in law now. I think I make some changes for small uh, employers, uh, workplace plans. Anything in there that uh, was really heartening to you or do you despair of the nibbling around the edges of the retirement issues? I mean, I think it's, um, <laughs> I've said that Secure 2.0 in my mind is much ado about little. Now mm. th- there is there is something there. Uh, I think a lot of it, just kind of it benefits people who need the help least like higher required minimum distribution ages. That's not going to help the reader of retirement reboot, you know, the middle-class household who's not worried about how do I avoid spending the minimum out of my retirement account? You know, I think things like making the savers credit refundable, that's a good thing. Uh, This, this emergency savings component within workplace plans, I think is interesting and not a bad thing. But I think all these things are incremental in the sense that they take years and years to uh, make a meaningful impact on our system. The fact is that we still have only about half of the workforce with access to a workplace retirement plan. And, you know, that's just leaving a lot of people out of the picture. And then even those who have access, if you're lower income, you know, you may not have the dollars available to save for this. You know, the, it's interesting. I was looking recently at the, um, you know, the, the nine or 10 states that have passed these state auto IRA programs, sort of, uh, you know, public option for saving for retirement in cases where you, you know, your employer doesn't have one. So, you know, nine or 10 states have now have these programs up and running and the, the opt-out rates are kind of high, you know, it's on the order of a third of workers opt out. And that's not surprising because we're talking generally about lower income workers, people working for small businesses. They have other things they need to spend money on before they can save for retirement. Mm -hmm. They have to worry about paying, keeping a roof overhead, paying for food, utilities. How am I saving to send my kids to college? Uh, Maybe I'm dealing with credit card debt, high cost debt, uh, or a student loan. And all those things, in my view, come ahead of retirement savings. You know, otherwise, especially with debt, does it make sense to be carrying a credit card, you know, mm-hmm. a balance at whatever it is, 15, 20% and be socking away money in a retirement plan? I don't think so. No, no. Uh, you, you've got some interesting statistics in the book on how uh, this, and I'll call it a crisis. I, I think you call it a crisis, a retirement crisis. Would you, would you characterize it as such? I mean, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that phrase. I tend not to use it because number one, it's, it's a charge phrase that kind of yeah. leads to a lot of, um, uh, argument that I don't find productive. And it also kind of Im- implicit there is sort of like, it makes me think of a, an immediate emergency where we'll really have this kind of a rolling problem fire fire kind rolling of thing, across right? the decades. But I think, yeah. yeah, if you want to say it, call it a crisis that, you know, look, 60% of households don't have anything saved. The average amount in a portfolio, uh, according to the federal reserve is about $140,000. And when you break that down, by the quintiles, it's much worse than that. You know, only the top two quintiles have significant dollars amassed, and everybody below that's got very little to nothing that's not going to last very long. So that's the back to where we started in this conversation about, well, okay, you have Social Security coming. Is that going to be enough? That's right. the problem that we're looking at. And unexpected well, and, and you, costs that come along, right? A health right. crisis, an emergency, et cetera. Or raging inflation. Uh you know, prices going up, uh, far outpacing wages or, you know, uh, income from social security. Uh, right. Although uh, could I, if I just interject really quickly on that point, mm-hmm. social security is adjusted for inflation. So thank goodness for that. That's a unique benefit that you can't get any place else. And uh, adjusted for the CPI, protects people. right. Uh, it's, for the uh, CPI. it's not for, you know, college costs, right. Uh, no. it's not adjusted for, you know, uh, healthcare costs. It's not adjusted for, right. Uh, you know, the price of eggs, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the, but the debate for people who are already retired is does the COLA formula do a good job of protecting against the cost people face in retirement? And that's a debate. Yeah. Uh, I was going to get to that. The, you were talking about the kind of the harsher impact on uh, Black and Hispanic Americans, uh, people of color. Uh, you have some interesting statistics there on how this situation more deeply impacts those communities. Right. And this is just all about income. So, you know, the situation is worse for people of color and for women because of income disparities. The um, The data set that I look at in the book is called the Elder Index. It's produced by the University of Massachusetts 
she has a center on gerontology that does good work in this area. And they basically are looking at here um, the ability of seniors to just meet basic living expenses, you know, roof overhead, food on the table, utilities, transportation, nothing fancy. And what they conclude is that for a single senior, um, well over half are struggling to meet their basic needs. And But the figures, when you look at um, Latino households, Black households are closer to 70%, maybe even higher. Um, and likewise, the rates are higher for women than they are for men. Now, married couples tend to do a little better. Um, 28% of people over age 65 who are married are are below the elder index, if you will. In other words, that's the percentage that are struggling to meet their needs because household finances tend to be better in those cases, right? You got typically two social security incomes coming in, for example. Uh, maybe maybe one spouse is still working, that sort of thing. But um, you know, pretty high figures, just just struggling to meet basic expenses. Yeah, it's crazy, and and I, you know, advisors would be uh, mistaken to think that this doesn't in some way impact. Uh, uh, their clients, uh, you know, what's uh, harmful to the economy is, is harmful to to everyone. Uh, and you can only hide in your uh, affluent bubble for so long. Uh, right. And when you, and thinking about men and women, again, from an advisor perspective, I think this gets covered quite a bit, but I, I think it's worth touching on that. It's, it's a good idea to focus on long-term economic security of your female clients, you know, thinking, thinking that out across a 25, 30 year retirement, I think is important. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good place to, to put a plan. If, if you had some uh, advice to get financial advisors, uh, you know, what they could be doing more of what they should be doing more of uh, where they should be looking uh, beyond just general retirement planning, which I think they kind of have yeah. uh, what to, what are some things that they should be thinking about? for their clients. Um, Not all of them yeah. uh, fall into the categories that we've been talking about, but uh, right. uh, overall, broadly speaking, how can financial right. advisors improve the outcomes for their clients? Needs? Yeah. And I actually focused on this in my most recent column for you guys, which is the topic mm -hmm. of longevity risk and how little it is understood. And I think for people who are working with financial planners and for the advisory community, really getting a better handle on this is important. Most people, when you look at the survey data, you ask just individuals to kind of rank the risks that they face in terms of their retirement plans. You don't typically pick like stock market risk. Maybe they pick um, rising costs of healthcare, but uh, objectively speaking, it is longevity risk or the risk of outliving assets. So ha have those conversations with clients, run the illustrations as I know advisors do. And I would in particular focus on social security there. And it's a really great argument for delayed claiming, maximizing your benefit. And I think the uh, the whole conversation about drawdown rates fits in, the, in there as well. And then uh, making smart choices about Medicare to do the best you can to get a handle on the cost of, of healthcare and retirement. The chapter mm -hmm. of the book on navigating Medicare it's really of interest, I think, to anybody on Medicare, not just um, certain income bands. And I, I make the argument in there that I think, if at all possible, I urge people to be on traditional Medicare, not not on Medicare Advantage, the the managed care alternative program. And I think, in particular, for the people listening to this podcast who have clients of some means, I just say that traditional Medicare, in my mind, is the gold standard of health insurance in the United States. You can't get a deal this good anywhere now where you can see just about any provider in the United States. If you have traditional Medicare plus a Medigap supplemental policy, you're pretty much covered on almost everything. All, all your out-of-pockets are going to be, you know, you're protected on those. Gives you the most predictability possible on long-term uh, costs of health insurance and retirement. And it's not just the dollars and cents thing. The, the flexibility to see any provider is so important in retirement because this is the time of life when people do encounter more healthcare, more health problems, unfortunately, and the need to see specialists rises. And so the ability to not have restrictions on, on the networks and the peace of mind of knowing that your doctor this year can still be your doctor next year is worth a lot. 
So I would just urge advisors to take a careful look and advise clients at the point of transition to retirement to, if they can swing the somewhat higher premium costs, pick traditional Medicare. It's it's maybe $2,500 more a year in premiums. So it's not nothing, but for households that can afford it, it's much better long-term protection. That's fantastic. Great, great uh, advice. Thank you, uh, Mark. I, I suggest to uh, advisors that, you know, uh, as more boomers retire, Gen Xers start to retire, uh, advisors get asked a lot of questions, uh, you know, uh, what should I be doing uh, as I'm kind of approaching or entering retirement? And not all those people who are asking the questions are going to be good clients for those advisors. I suggest they get a pile of your books and hand those <laughs> out as a gesture of goodwill, right? Uh, you know, you might not be a good fit for our firm, but, you know, here's a book that uh, would, would maybe answer some of your questions and help point you in some good directions. <laughs> I love that suggestion. <laughs> but I, I think it's a good one. Reason. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good one. Uh, and it certainly would work for that. So, uh, uh, Mark, thanks very much. And thank you for your contributions to uh, wealth management. Uh, it's great. I know advisors get a lot out of it. Uh, and for the book and the work that you do, uh, it's it's great stuff. And I'm, I'm happy you're doing it. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Always a pleasure to talk with you. And um, I also value the relationship and being able to talk to the advisory uh, audience through wealthmanagement.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been the Advisor Innovations Podcast. I'm David Armstrong. See you next time. 